guys and what a great time to be able to worship God and uh, yeah you're starting to see some changes around here just so you know the color was picked to match Jackie's shirt <laughs> so that's how we come up with color uh, lots of changes are going to be happening and so if you see some don't assume okay that's the end of it there's there's going to be a whole lot more coming and I know by the time we get finished, it's going to be really great. And, and I know uh, Jackie's just been doing a really good job with a lot of the construction and a lot of the things happening around here. So thank you, Jackie, for all that you've been doing. We want to talk about my least favorite subject. <laughs> Maybe yours, too. <laughs> this is an equal offending sermon. <laughs> all right? So... Just so you know, from the very beginning, that's kind of where we are, and uh, sometimes they give you on a track of here's what you should preach, and we've been talking about believe and about fruits of the Spirit and about some of those things lately, and so <clears throat> self-control, hmm, as you look at this, we all have issues, I don't know that I've seen anybody that is absolutely in control of every single part of their life. And if they are, I like them. <laughs> Just start with that. How's that? So I think that's what happens to us. And when you start looking at what it says in Scripture, it does is a reason for it. There is a reason we need to have this self-control. Of course, the ultimate control Here's the ultimate control for you. That's it, right? <laughs> I mean, if we have that, we can change the world. One screen at a time, of course, but what else would you need? Uh, I think this is just one of those things that happens as we look at the passage and look at what the passage talks about. He talks about how should we please God. And he says, I ask you, I urge you through Jesus Christ, we've given you instruction on this. How do you please God? How do you do this? And this is what God wants. This is the will of God. How do we do that? Well, the way in which we do that is that you be able to say no. And he particularly here picks on sex. He says that you abstain from sexual immorality, that you know how to control your own body, holy honor. Don't live like people who are completely out of control about sex. And of course, he just jumps right into the middle of that. We never see that going on in our world, do we? A lot. So much that it's just become accepted. And for him to say all this or to even read this as a passage, we're going, huh? That's in the Bible? Because a lot of people would guess that God's love. God loves everybody and, yeah, love leads to, no, love leads to honor. Love leads to respect. Love is... Certainly God created sex. He is not against sex at all. He is against immorality. And that's the main thing that you have to know with this. He says it's not a, a passionate lust. It's, it's for genuine true love. And that's really what that's all about. He says, I don't want you to be wronging your brother. And a lot of times that's what happens with immorality. It's because there's somebody else connected. It's because there's adultery. It's because marriages are going to fall apart. He says, I don't want you to be wronging your brother in all of these things. He says, by the way, I'm the avenger if you do. That's enough to make me wake up a little bit. It's not just, is somebody else going to catch me at it? And I think that's where we're always worried. No, I'll never get caught. You're already caught by the guy who's going to punish you. There is no way you're going to hide from that. And he's the one who says, I will take the punishment. You don't think you're caught. You are caught already. And you just haven't had it happen to you yet. And so that's what he's trying to describe here. There's a reason why you would want to have self-control. So you don't get punished. Let me just ask you, did you ever get spanked as a kid? 
Never? Was there a reason why? I know your parents were completely unfair. They just did not understand the situation of why you were right. No, most of us deserved it, right? And we deserved it a lot more than what we got. He says, today, God's the one who's going to be the avenger. So if he's the avenger, what does that mean? That means maybe we ought to have some self-control and learn how to use what God has given us as an absolutely beautiful gift to learn to use it in the right way. Because it's not that he doesn't want sex. It's not that he doesn't want anyone to have it. He just doesn't want you to do it in a way that cheapens it, that abuses it, and that messes up every relationship in your life. He wants you to have it in a way that will make your life so much better and the relationship you do have with the other person. Immorality destroys all that. And we haven't even gotten past the first five minutes. Here's what happens with all of this. He says he made us for holiness, not for sin. And he's given us the Holy Spirit in order to make us holy. So here's the remote. Don't you wish you had that? I could change whatever I want to change. But the remote isn't about self-control. Here's the one about self-control. All right. It says don't push the button, doesn't it? When is he going to learn? This is number three, I think. So by the third time, do you learn? When is he going to learn? Probably just about as fast as... I'll just let that run for a little bit. <laughs> just to remind you, this might be you this morning. So that, you know, when you want to stop getting beaten up, it might be time to develop a little bit of self-control. Is he going to... Oh, gosh, again? <laughs> really, don't you know better by now? I, I mean, really. There are so many things that go on in our world today where we need control, where we need to be able to do this. They came out some years ago with an ad. We realized that drugs were a problem in our society, and they came out with the, the, the government-funded research about here's what should happen. Just say no. You remember that? You know how well that's worked? about as well as he's doing, okay? Why doesn't that work? That's actually the only thing that's going to work because there's no amount of control we can make over people that will make them not do it. They have got to realize I'm the one who's in charge of it. I'm the one who has to say. I'm the one who's going to do this. Don't push the button. Oh, there he goes again. We have to learn to just say no. It puts the responsibility right back on us. But we're saying no to things that feel good. We're saying no to things that, you know, the world calls happiness. Really, is that happiness? You're getting tired of getting slapped around? We usually want to control everybody else because, after all, they're not doing it right, and uh, we want to control them, but uh, we want to give ourselves anything we want. You know, when I have to say no to myself on purpose, to something that I want, that's a little bit difficult, isn't it? And why would I do that? The reason is to get where I want to be. Okay, uh, is he going to win? Ever? All right, I can show you a way where he could if he makes the choice, all right? Some of you have had kids before. <laughs> How do you control a two-year-old? Not very well. And sometimes that's the way we act. Fortunately, we don't stay at that stage. And you teach, and you train, and you explain, 
so that they will develop their own self-control. Because really before that, you, they didn't have to have it. I mean, you knew it. You could do it. You had the place there. You could say, no, you can't do that. And then, you know, lock them in their room or something to where they weren't able to do it. You just put it on a higher shelf. They're not tall enough to get it. There comes a point at which there's no higher shelf. I mean, they're 18 and they can do whatever they want to do. And they're taller than you are. Self-control. At some point, they need to learn how to have it. And we put up with each other until that happens. They decide they're going to scream, they're going to pout, they're going to demand, they're going to be out of control. And when I get what I want, I'm out of control. Do you realize that? Every time you get everything you want, it means your life is out of control. Because it means unless you had to have some self-control somewhere along the line, you have not decided to live for God. Some things are just not good for a two-year-old. They shouldn't be touching stoves. They shouldn't be eating the drain cleaner or the dog food either. But, you know, they're going to do those things. We end up with a whole lot of things that are loss of control. First one we talked about was sex. Drugs is another one. Food is another one. Do we have trouble with that one? Well, food's not wrong. Neither are the others. You're going to need some medication. Sex isn't wrong either. It's just in the wrong place in the wrong time, and food is exactly the same way. What about controlling your time or your temper or your mouth or your eyes or your thoughts or your hands or your want or maybe even just allowing other people to control you? That doesn't work. Because then you have no self-control. And that's what he says the answer is. We really need to have self-control. If you can't read it, it says, this jar would be filled with candy, but no one in the room has any self-control. <laughs> but what's candy for anyway? Isn't it meant to be enjoyed? And so, just one piece. And it's all the rest of you people. I had my one no, never mind. We know how that goes. The jar gets empty way too fast. There's two parts to this self-control idea, though. The first is that we need to control some of the bad things that go on. Anger, temper, our mouth, the things that we are going to say to people. There needs to be some filter on that. There needs to be some control over that. There needs to be some control over evil things that we find in our life. Self-control is really about the Garden of Eden again, isn't it? Eve looks at the fruit that, that the serpent is talking about and says, Wow, that looks beautiful. It's going to be great. It's going to make everything good. Uh, it's going to taste good. What's the downside? Well, the downside is it's a sin. The downside is it's wrong before God. The downside is it gets you thrown out of the garden into a world you never wanted to have. And that's exactly what happens when we don't have any self-control. We get pushed into some place that we did not want to be. A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. How long does he have any say in his life? It doesn't take very long before everybody else comes in and pushes him wherever they want him to go and forces him into this, and pushes him into that, and tempts him over here. And unless we have some self-control to build up our own walls to say, I'm going to decide this, then we have no defense. We can't stop it. We can say it's unfair, but the unfair part is we won't do anything about it. We have to be able to say no. We have to be able to say stop. We have to be able to say, I'm not going to put up with this anymore. I'm going to change my life so that I live it better. That man is at the mercy of those people who destroy. Or he's at the mercy of a man who heals. Because I think there's two sides to self-control. One side is trying to deal with evil in our world. The other side 
is we use self-control for good. Did any of you watch the Olympics? It's exciting, huh? All kinds of stuff happening. 116 medals for the United States. All kinds of stuff that went on. You're able to see great events. You're able to see lots of things that, that happened. Um, impressive people and some of the things that they did. We got 43 gold, 37 silver, and 36 bronze, more than any other nation. But we're kind of used to that, aren't we? So that's kind of the way it goes. And, and we were able to just take a number of medals, not all of them, however. World's fastest man, Usain Bolt, for the third Olympic. He has swept the 100 meter. 12 years, really? In fact, they were saying the way you get to go to the Olympics is, you know, you get the fastest time. You have to qualify. And it's like 10 seconds in the 100 meter. He's, you know, anyway, he, he's able to qualify. And then not everybody can just go. We don't just get to go. We have to qualify in all of these different events. And that you don't just take the top guys in the world. He says you have to give only so many to one country because if you took all the top runners in the world, they would all be Jamaican. <laughs> there would be no other countries competing because they hold the top 18 records in the world. Nobody else competes. But the only real way that anybody else got a chance to compete is because they limit them to three. And the only way to get there is to train. No. The only way to get there is to train harder than anyone else. That's the way you get there. Paul talks about the race. He talks about the way it says, Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run in a way that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do, not receive, they do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable so do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. And so Paul even recognizes the difficulty of having that kind of self-control and uses this idea of running to win. One of the ones that we won was the 400 meter USA. Great thing, able to do this. But those guys don't get there because... They just woke up one day and decided, I think I'll go. They had to train, they had to work, they had to control every single part of their life. And that's what Paul's saying, I discipline my body to keep it under control. Why? Because I have a prize I want to win. The bigger the prize, the more control it takes. The more discipline it takes, the more it's going to take to be able to accomplish and to do some of those things. And so when you look at those things, it's important to realize an athlete makes his body work for him. Not him saying, well, body, you can have whatever you want. I'll let you control me. And that's what happens so much today is, well, my taste controls me. My good feeling controls me. What I want controls me. And that's what advertising does for us. I mean, it's just everywhere. It's all over the place. And we allow those things to control us or we say, no, I'm going to take control of my feelings, my emotion, my body, my good feelings, and I'm going to say, here's where I want to be. We train our body so that we are able to make it for us. And that's what makes all the difference. The discipline is to be able to accomplish. So how are we doing in training Christians? How are we doing in training ourselves in prayer, in Bible study, in faith, in mercy, in all of these things? There's one secret you need to know. We'll never get to the Olympics. Okay, maybe some of you. Maybe Calvin. He's an in-shape guy, you know. He might could get to the Olympics and maybe Tim. I know Tim's pretty close there. He's starting to train. He's, you know, he can 
throw that shot put, it's, it's pretty far out there. I should have asked Tim how far he throws it. You know, 90 feet yet, Tim? <laughs> well, no, that's ridiculous. When you start thinking about some of those things, it's just incredible to realize what people do. But for some of us, this is just a hopeless message. Because we've been doing this a long time and trying to have some kind of control, and we keep failing and failing and failing and failing, so it's just about time to give up now. Because I don't know that we're ever really going to gain control over the things we want. Because we have tried so many times, it just seems almost impossible. There is good news. In Romans 8 and many other passages, Paul writes about the Spirit. In fact, the first one that we read was about the Spirit. And here in Romans 8, he says in verse 11, if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. You see, if it was just up to me and my will and my own self-control, I can't do it. I'm not that organized. I'm not that good at this. That's why I hate this sermon. <laughs> but there's good news at the end because here's what happens with it. God says, I'll let you choose where you want to be. And I will give you my spirit and he will produce self-control in you. I said, yay, finally, something that would make sense. And he's not talking here, as you look at this passage, I don't have to, time to explain it all, but he talks about he, the, the way in which we're dead is we're dead in sin and, and all of that, and he who raises Jesus from the dead, and he's drawn a parallel off of resurrection, will give life to your mortal bodies. Well, when do I need that? After I die and I'm in heaven? No. When I need that is now. He will give life to your mortal bodies, not the ones who are resurrected, the ones who are here now, your physical bodies through his spirit who indwells you. That's what he's going to be able to do. If by the spirit you put to death deeds of the body, in other words, the Spirit gives us a way in order which we are able to have self-control that we don't have by just our own will. It's not just a matter of saying who's the best guy who's able to train to get to Olympics. It's who's the closest man to God so that he can live a godly life. So that God can change his heart, so that God can change his whole soul and he is able then to be controlled by the Spirit. The Spirit is, you have control all the time. Because you can say no to that Spirit and decide, no, I'm going to just run off and do whatever I want. And he'll let you. And you'll pay for it. And if you want to pay for it, then he'll let you. He says, I'm the avenger. You think you won't get caught? You think you can hide from God? Really? Really? He says, but if you want to way, find a way out, there is a way out. I think until now, a lot of people have seen Christianity as just try harder. That's not the message this morning. The message this morning is that God has a way to produce self-control through his Holy Spirit in your life when you surrender to him. And that's what makes this a good message. It's a simple choice, right? Which one do you want? Which one would you take? Well, we like green apples. Until there's, you know, what is that, a brownie? With a cherry on top. Oh, the cherry. The cherry always gets you, doesn't it? It's not about just trying harder because you know which one you ought to have and you know which one already has a bite out of it. 
And that's kind of the way it is. Our self-control needs to take on a new dimension, not just me trying harder, but God within me trying to say, this isn't going to be good for you, and you know it. You can see it. You can realize it. And he produces that fruit in us to say, here's what changes your life. The Spirit gives us some self-control. And he produces that when we surrender to him, when we allow him to work in our life. It isn't that you still don't have the choice. You will always have the choice. But all of a sudden, apples look better. And you realize this is actually what's going to be good for me so that I don't have to get punished by something else. And it's what's going to be the best. We always have that choice. Let me give you one last illustration with Jesus. In Matthew chapter 4, as he's looking at the temptations, and uh, it's an amazing passage, really, when you start to unravel all the different parts of this. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. And he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so you have Jesus driven, led by the Spirit, pushed there on purpose. Here's where you're going to go next, into a wilderness where there is no food. And the reason he's there is to be tempted by the devil. As you look at that, that's a pretty incredible thing to say, I'm going to a certain place in order for Satan to tempt me, but that's what happens. And he spends 40 days and 40 nights there without food. And he is at that starvation point. And Satan reminds him, you have the power to turn stones to bread. You could solve your own situation. Look at the stones. Look at what they would, and I imagine by that time, he is at starvation point. Don't you see bread? You could turn stones to bread. And you could eat, and you could live, and you could go and live your ministry, and you would be a, a great savior then because it's just one miracle. And you're going to do so many of them. In fact, you're going to turn one loaf or two loaves into loaves for thousands. And so that should be fine. Stones to bread is no problem. Why does Jesus say, I won't do it? It's self-control. It's what self-control is all about. He says... I live by the word of God. I don't live just by bread. And to prove it, I'm not turning stones to bread. If you understand that, then you have the first part of self-control. If you don't understand that yet, think about it some more. Because it really comes to that point when you see something you want so much and are desperate for and would make your life better. And this is the very thing that I need. And you say, I will wait for God to give it to me. You have self-control. I'm not there yet. I don't know about you guys. I can see it off somewhere, and every once in a while afterwards, I think, oh. But it's that kind of thing that says, you know what? I live for him. And if you look down later in that passage in verse 11, after Satan left, the angels came and ministered to him. And they had steak and lobster and bread and all. I mean, they came and... It wasn't any rock bread. <laughs> because you wait for God. You wait for what God does, and that's really what self-control is all about. It's not saying, I'm going to take from this world whatever I want because it makes me feel good. It says, I'm going to wait for God to give me in his world because it's going to be incredible. 
And I don't know where you are this morning in this whole thing. Maybe you're caught right in the middle of, of just a complete lack of self-control. I would say you're in good company because all of us are. None of us are exempt from the list. We just probably all have different things on the list. If you were in Jimmy's class, he had a huge list. Good job, Jimmy. I appreciate your teaching and what you did and what you said. And if you want his notes, man, he's, he's got a really good way of explaining that. But self-control, you know where it is. And you know what it's about. And do you want God's help? Because that's really the answer to the whole thing. Why would you have control? Because it's going to make me better. It's going to make me be where God wants me to be. We control our actions to a greater purpose so that we change our life. And it's not about the negative. It's not about you can't have. It's about, no, I want something better than this. And I believe God can have it and he can give it to him. So maybe it's time to pray so that you can have some self-control and we'd be glad to do that and pray with you. Or maybe it's just time to start at the very beginning and say, you know what, I need that spirit. I need to be baptized into Christ so that I can have that spirit. And then I need to pray and then I need help and then, yeah, God's going to be there. What about your self-control today? Do you need any help? Let us know if we can. Would you stand and sing?